Dr. Mukund Chorgade. That was under the aegis of Professor V. M. Kulkarni Endowment. Now, these next two lectures are under the aegis of, of course, ICT and also American Chemical Society because I am the ACS India International President and I'm the founding president of that. So I'm delighted to welcome you in my capacity as the president and also vice chancellor of Institute of Chemical Technology. Uh, but at the same time, I must give you some background about these lectures which we organize. In the morning, I told you that we have 49 endowments for various lectures. These are named endowments, named after our teachers. Some of them are named after Golden Jubilee when we celebrated our Golden Jubilee. And this particular one, I have fond memories of this uh, Professor B.D. Tilak endowment. This is, uh, this endowment under this, we have these visiting uh, fellowships in ICT. Professor Tilak was former professor of dye stuff technology in ICT. He was, when he was appointed, he was the youngest professor. And that record was broken by Professor M.M. M. Sharma when he joined at the age of 27 as a full professor. Wow. But Professor Tilak was a very fine organic chemist, dye stuff technologist, and also champion of dye stuff uh, industry in this country. Then what happened one fine morning, the person who see, whose picture you see, Professor K. Venkatraman, he was the first Indian director of Institute of Chemical Technology. And he went to National Chemical Laboratory, NCL, as the director. He went on Lian for two years, and then he stayed there. And Professor Tilak was the student of Venkatraman. And when he was to retire, he just lured him to NCL for one year. And then later on, he became the director and he stayed there. But as fate would have been, he continued his association with ICT. And when he retired <coughs> in 1977, I guess, so there was a committee formed under the chairmanship of Professor M.M. M. Sharma, the former director of this institute and also who had a very long association with Professor Tilak to collect funds in his name. And I was a PhD student that time with Professor Sharma and we used to keep all accounts of who is giving money and what for and all those things. And then we had a great celebration here. And this endowment was established that time in 1978. And under this endowment, we organized many things. There are six different uh, lectures, then visiting fellowships and all. And I will also tell you, because we were part of Mumbai University, we were not allowed to use that name professor, <laughs> visiting professor. So we said, OK, visiting fellow. We started with visiting fellow. But actually, the title was also visiting professor. Uh, so under that endowment, this lecture series have been organized. So we have two lectures today. Uh, one is uh, the very first one about, uh, uh, this is very interesting lecture and Professor Ashwin Patwardhan will formally introduce Professor Geraldine Richmond, who is a presidential chair and professor of chemistry at Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at University of Oregon. And the next one is by Professor Colin Suckling, who is a research professor at University of Strathclyde. We have a collaboration. We have signed an MOE with Strathclyde, and he's a very well-known chemist, and um, he is, of course, the order of British Empire, like our Padma Awardee. So we have these two great personalities this afternoon, and the third one will join after us. He is on the way. He has gone to Mumbai University for the convocation. The Nobel laureate, uh, 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 Sir uh, uh, Richard Roberts, he will, he's on the way. I got a message. So we want to have these two lectures. And I also want to tell you something. This is Beam. It is you know, online, so people can see it on their mobile. They can see it on computer, internet. We are also beaming this to our new campuses, which we started this year. So you can see some of the students there. 
there is a lot of 30 students there in, in uh, Jalna, and the other one is in Bhuneshwar. So they also should enjoy all the lectures over here. We have created this facility. So ladies and gentlemen, how delighted I am to have this series. Today is a great day for ICT, 11th of January. And so I welcome you, ma'am. I welcome you, Dr. Suckling, to ICT. And we will have now the former, uh, you know, formality is over. Now Dr. Ma Ashwin Patwadhan will introduce uh, Professor Richman. Very good afternoon. It is indeed, indeed a great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor uh, Richmond. She is uh, currently chair in presidential chair in the. She is currently the presidential chair in science and professor of chemistry at University of Oregon, serving as a member of National Science Board, U.S. Science and as as a U.S. Science Envoy, recent past president of American Association of Advancement of Science, incoming president of Sigma Xi Scientific Honor Society. She's a member of National Academy of Sciences and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has tremendous uh, contributions in the area of um, uh, surface science. Her research includes laser spectroscopy and computational methods and focusing on the processes that happen at the interface. Her academic part of her work that's well recognized in many uh, places, many awards, 2018 Priestley Medal for American Chemical Society, Linus Pauling Medal Award, National Medal of Science, American Physical Society, Davidson, uh, Davidson Germer Prize, ACS Joel H. Hildebrand Award in Theoretical and Experimental Studies of Liquid. So besides the technical contribution, her outreach activities and her other social uh, activities include, she is, uh, uh, her science outreach activities in particular, she has received awards for that and science capability, capability building in, in US and other countries. So some of the prominent ones are ACS Charles L. Parson Award for Outstanding Public Service, ACS Award for Encouraging Women in Chemical Sciences. Uh, one of the most notable ones, is she was the uh, founding director of the organization, which was started in 1998 and has now helped 20,000 women scientists in different countries in reaching their academic potential in the field of science. So it is indeed a great pleasure that she is with us here today and she can share with us her technical work and we all look forward to your entertainment. You. Very enlightening lecture. Well, it's indeed a pleasure for me to be with you today. I have to, not have to, I want to um, give a special thanks to Dr. McCoon who helped arrange all my visit here. I called him up and I said, I still want to come to India, can you help? And here I am. And so I'm very honored to be able to uh, be a fellow of this institution and to be here with you all today. So uh, as indicated, my science has a lot to do with uh, surfaces and a lot to do with lasers. And so it's quite a bit of a departure from uh, the first talk this morning and the second talk too. So uh, you'll see I come at this as very much in chem a chemical physicist, physical chemist, and looking at how we can understand processes at surfaces. Now I have a real passion for environmental issues. I come from a state, the state of Oregon, which is known to be very green for a lot of reasons. First of all, we get a lot of rain, so everything grows. So if you're a gardener, it's a great place to be. Uh, but also we care, we care so much about the environment and keeping it clean. And also in Oregon, we get a lot of rain, particularly this time of year. And so water is a great thing to study if you're in Oregon because it's pretty cheap because you get so much of it. Um, and so what I'm going to tell you about today are some issues related to water and particularly water surfaces. And what I'm going to focus on uh, specifically is what happens when you have oil and water together, oil spread on water. Now, uh, this of course has, we all know issues of, which I'll mention, the issues of uh, when you have an oil spill, cleaning it up is extraordinarily difficult, so I'll touch on that topic. But it's not just an oil spill, it's also fracking. Any kind of way in which you're also drilling for oil, you're using a lot of water, and the water comes out a mix of oil and water, and so separating those is exceedingly difficult. And so, although we don't actively go out and separate them or do cleanup, 
What we do is provide the detailed information that helps others to design and predict, design uh, products that can help clean it up and also predict when there's going to be problems ahead. So with that, I'm just going to jump right in. So <clears throat> the interface between oil and water, that junction in which oil and water meets, has actually been a fascination of people for centuries. In fact, we can go back to the days of Benjamin Franklin. And what he noticed when he did his, his trips across the Atlantic Ocean, what he noticed was that if there was a, a series of boats, a flotilla, that there was one boat at which the seas behind that boat, the water behind that boat, was very calm, whereas everyone else was rocking around. And that one boat was the cook's galley. And what he observed was after they threw the slop from the dinner over the side of the boat, it would actually calm down the seas. And so he speculated that that was probably because of the fatty stuff that was left over from cooking. So he became very fascinated by oil on water. Why was this, why would it calm the seas? In fact, he was known for going through the British countryside with a cane and a little vial of oil on the top of that cane and when he came up on a pristine lake, he would pour that oil onto the lake to see what would happen. Now in the US, you'd probably get arrested for doing that these days, but he got away with it. And what he wanted to do was just understand why it spread. What he missed out on was doing some very simple calculations, which was to calculate the size of that spread and assume that only a molecular layer would go down, which 100 years later, Rayleigh, got the Nobel Prize for calculating the size of a molecule. But this whole fascination between that oil-water interface goes back a long ways, and it's only until just the last decade, I would say, that we've started to understand it. And so this is just a picture of what he would see as he would go across uh, the ocean. Now, some people would say, or if you go back into the uh, literature, you can see theories that suggest that when oil is next to water, uh, that oil is hydrophobic, and so oil and water don't like each other, and you go into the biological texts in particular, and they'll say that when water gets next to oil, that the water actually balls up like a clathrate and doesn't want to have anything to do with the oil. Okay, it just hates it. And other recent theories in the last 10 or 20 years have suggested that when oil and water come near each other, that they don't actually touch, that there's actually a vacuum layer in between the two. And so what we went, wanted to do was develop an experimental way that you could go in and look on a molecular level what happens when you put oil on water. Do they really stay away from each other? Does water behave very differently than when it's in the bulk of the water? And that's our, been our mission the last number of years. So why is this important beyond just, well, certainly for the environmental issues, but also we know that oil-water interfaces are everywhere. Your body is all a, a oil-water interface. Your membranes are oily. <laughs> you know, your blood is aqueous. And so you have transport across those uh, boundaries. So understanding that oil-water interface also is a lot of importance to biology. But it also is, you know, we know that if you have uh, hand cream, that it's an emulsion. It's a mixture of oil and water that stays as an emulsion, little tiny droplets of oil in something that's aqueous or vice versa, because you have surfactants that stabilize those tiny droplets. And if they don't stabilize it well, then they separate. You've probably seen when you've had oil and water mixtures that you shake them up, they form an emulsion, and then they'll eventually separate. And so we have, uh, and so we're really interested in not only that separation process, but also what happens at that junction because it has implications in a wide range of different areas. And so our molecular insights are really different because even if you go to most chemical companies, they've never been able to do the kind of experiments that we can do. And so they rely on people like us to do experiments they can't do to help them develop safer soaps and surfactants and things that can be used commercially. But it's also important just from a scientific perspective. Now, I don't know if you do this demonstration uh, and, and classes here, but there's a demonstration that we tr tend to do in the United States for the organic chemistry students, and that is to take uh, oil and water and put a few monomers in there, and they actually get catalyzed at the interface to form a polymer and nylon, and then you just pull the nylon out. 
So the junction can actually act as a catalyst for making polymers. But it also is important, as I mentioned, for understanding biological interfaces. But also, in technology, there's a lot of interest in making surfaces that are super hydrophobic, where the water just completely balls up on top of that surface and has very different characteristics. Some cooking pans, for example, have Teflon on them, and those are very hydrophobic surfaces. But these technologies are to take that even further. Okay, so the focus of my talk is going to be on three particular areas. The first one, which is what do we know about how molecules behave when they're at this interface? Do they ball up as a clathrate or do you have a vacuum layer between the two? Secondly, how do polymers go there? How do surfactants go there? Because that tells us whether or not they will form different emulsions and so forth. But these are, and also, I'll talk about peptoid sheets. A lot of this for drug delivery. But also, then, most of the studies of the first, first two topics will be on a planar oil-water interface. And more recently, then, we've been going to studying little droplets of oil and water. The idea is, do water molecules and oil molecules behave differently on a flat surface as opposed to when you put them in little tiny nano droplets? Now, to give you a perspective, this is really the forefront of surface science in the world. Because a lot of the surface science today has been done on solid surfaces. Much less has been done on liquid surfaces, except for theoretical work. And so to actually have experiments to, to be able to test the theoretical work is an important component of what we do. So how do we do these experiments? As mentioned, we do a lot of laser experiments. So if you were to go into my laboratory, you would find my students working on great big, huge lasers on tables this long for one experiment. And then a lot of little optics perfectly aligned so that the laser beams from the lasers can get to what we have a sample of water and then with oil on top of it and then study that junction. Now the difficulty is, of course, they're ultra-fast lasers. They're picosecond and femtosecond lasers, very high powered. And you have to get that to align and you have to have several beams that align to the surface perfectly. So we have two beams. What you see in there of an oil-water interface is you have two beams that are on the surface right here. You have two beams coming onto the surface, the water and the oil, and you've got to perfectly align them to hit at the right spot and the right angle. And, they've, and they're pulsed, so they, the pulse has to hit there at the same time, and they only last a femtosecond, a few femtoseconds or picoseconds. So it's not easy, but let me tell you how it gets harder. You can barely see with your own eye the visible or the IR beam. In fact, you can't see the IR beam. So my students have to align these beams with special equipment to be able to see them because our eye can't pick them up. So it's not an easy experiment, but when it works, you get a lot of good information from it. And if it doesn't work, then you end up boiling water, and that's not good. <laughs> it's a very expensive way to boil water. So what we do then is we look at the signal that comes off of this, uh, of this interface. We're tuning the infrared beam and looking at the light that comes off of that. So let me just ask in here, because I don't know your background so much, how many of you know something about vibrational spectroscopy? Vibration, you know, I see a little hand coming. Anyone ever measure a Raman or infrared spectrum of vibrational mo motions of molecules? Anyone? Just a few? I've got a few hands? Okay. Okay, so now I know where I need to go with this. Okay, so the point is that what we're trying to do is to measure the fingerprints of what these molecules are doing. And that is that every molecule has a signature as to how it vibrates, okay? So they have different vibrational modes associated with them, and if they're a little bit slower, they take different light. If they're a little bit faster, they take different light. It's just the frequency associated with it. And so every, every time we can get that laser beam to correspond to the color, to correspond to the frequency of these modes of the molecules, that tells us something about the molecules. Okay, and I'll go back to this when we talk about water. That tells us how many other molecules they're bonded to. It tells us something about how they orient. It tells us a lot of information. So at that junction, if we want to know if they're standing up, sitting down, laying down, or bonding to anybody, that signal that comes off tells us that information. 
why do we have to have two laser beams rather than just one? Well, if we just had one laser beam, it's very similar to if you were looking down, looking into, you know, down onto water. And that's just a, a linear, and the light comes off. You see yourself because there's reflected light off that water, and you see yourself. And that's called a linear response, okay? And that light that's reflected off that you can see yourself in, or we could measure a vibrational spectrum with, actually comes from quite deep in the water. It's not just the top layer. It's not just the top few angstroms. It's actually, it can be a thousand angstroms down. And so if you, and so, you know, if you're just trying to study the guys right on top, you're getting a lot of signal from the guys down here. And they're going to dwarf any signal from the top layer. And so what we have to do is get tricky to make sure that the light that's reflected only comes from the top 10 angstroms, the top two or three water molecules on top. And that's why we need to have two laser beams, because you have to have two laser beams in order to get the kind of signal that we want. This makes it a nonlinear process. So now, the only way that special light is reflected off is if there is a, an inversion, broken inversion symmetry. Have you heard of that? Anyone broken inversion symmetry? Okay, let's do that. So that means that what's above looks different than below. Okay, if you're in the middle of your water glass, you look up, water looks the same as when you look down, right? You get to the top layer of water, you see air, it looks different than when you look down, right? That's water. An oil-water interface, <laughs> you got your head looking up at the oil, looks different than what's below, but only at the junction. This optical process with the two laser beams only happens if you have that broken symmetry. What's above looks different than what's below. And that's the tricky part. But it's also great because now we know we're looking, so the signal we get is just at the top layer, no deeper. Okay? And that's what's really made the field be able to go forward in recent years. So it's all worth all that hard work because now rather than just reflecting a, a single laser beam off, with two, you can just get the top guys on top, and I'll show you why that information is important. So now that I've turned you all into physicists, <laughs> and physical chemists, we'll move on. Okay, so we also then, that technique is great, and it gives us what we call a vibrational spectrum of molecules, like is shown up here. Gives us a signal when we pick up those molecules that vibrate at the right frequency. But it, it has weaknesses too, and one of the weaknesses if you put something at that oil-water junction, you don't know how much is there. You just know there's stuff there. And so we have to be able to do surface tension measurements and those much simpler measurements, which have been around a long time, those measurements tell us how much stuff is there or if something is there. So what do you know about the surface of water with regards to surface tension? Does it have a high surface tension or a low surface tension? How many vote for high? How many understood the question? Does a surface of water have a high surface tension or a low surface tension? High? Oh, just bet, for heaven's sake. Okay, high, low. Let's vote again. High? Yes. Great, right answer. Okay, it has a high surface tension, which means stuff can float on it. Okay? If it has a low surface tension, stuff doesn't float on it. Okay? And so what that's, that surface tension measurement tells you is that there's stuff at that junction. And when there's stuff there, the surface tension plummets. So that's how your soap works. You got greasy hands, you put soap on it, put your hands under the water, the grease goes away because the soap lowers the surface tension between your oil and your water. And all that junk goes away, right? Same thing for your laundry. So we worry a lot about, well, maybe you don't, unless you do a lot of laundry. Uh, we as scientists worry a lot about what happens when that something lowers the surface tension. So I'll come back to that again. But we use it as a tool. It was actually, this first measurement of surface tension was measured back in the 1800s by a young woman named Agnes Pockles, who was 17 years old, washing dishes for her family, and devised an instrument with a needle, thread, and and button to make the first measurements of the surface tension. 
and we now use an instrument very similar to what she did. She was never allowed to go to college. She was in Germany, never allowed to go to college. But she wrote to a famous scientist who recognized her brilliance and published her work. Later, Langmuir got the Nobel Prize for that. We'll move, we'll move on. So we also do then theoretical work that goes with it because it helps us to augment our experiments. OK. So I've been through this. But I always have to show a few equations, just in case someone in the audience likes to see equations. This is just showing that the laser beams are all over the place. They're, they're really directed towards the interface. But for those of you that have had some vibrational spectroscopy, you might know that infrared vibrational spectroscopy, there are certain selection rules. And Raman, there are certain selection rules. So sometimes you can measure a Raman spectrum, sometimes an infrared vibrational spectrum. I see at least one nod back there. So there are selection rules. In this kind of fr some frequency, the modes have to be both infrared and Raman active. OK? There, I'll stop there. And this equation is just telling us that, but basically the bottom line is that we're measuring the spectrum of molecules at the surface. OK, this is the spectrum now. So this is one of the first spectrum. It took us two years to get this spectrum. Um, but we finally got it. And this, yes, the student did get his PhD. And so this is actually carbon tetan water. And we use carbon tet as the oil because the infrared beam can easily get through it. Okay? But the point is that we've got this you know, lumpy thing, and then we've got this really sharp peak. And I told you that water molecules, they can, vib you know, they can vibrate. And so what this broad intensity refers to, these are now water molecules at an oil-water interface. Okay? Broad blob, call it, you know, that's really technical terms, broad blob and then this very sharp peak. The water molecules that are giving us this kind of signal down here are water molecules that are tetrahedrally bonded. You've heard of that, that water likes to bond to three or four other water molecules. So at the surface, there are some molecules that bond very tightly to each other. We get here, these are water molecules that bond to a couple other water molecules. You would never see a signal here from bulk water because you don't normally have water, much water that's just bonded to two other water molecules. But at the surface, you see them. So this getting, as I've said before in talks that I've given, this is where you have a really active party and everybody's dancing with three or four people at once. This is where you only have one or two dance partners, OK? But this weird sharp one is the strange one. And so water's doing something very different to give this very sharp peak. And so what water's doing to give that very sharp peak is these guys, it's, if I'm oxygen and these are my hydrogens, I'm just kind of rocking around, grabbing onto everybody. But this guy, he's doing this, or she's doing this. OK? One hand in the oil, one hydrogen into the oil, and one into the water. When you take your next, next time you take a glass of water and you drink it, I want you to think about looking down at that water, because it's the same thing. A glass of water's got some hydrogens hanging out there, just ready to grab onto you, right? All right, OK? So it's very odd to have this hanging out there. And in fact, by this, and I'll show you, this frequency that we get is really important. But this measurement tells us that not, not all water is just having a great party in there. Some of them are just hanging out as loners at the top. And so what do we know then, I'm going to pull this over, what do we know then about water molecules at this oil-water interface? Well, we've got, what we've got are these guys that are We've got these guys that are straddling the interface. It's about 20%, 25% is an estimate. And the rest of them then, this is the aqueous layer. I flipped the organics on the bottom. Depends on whether you have one or dense or not. But think of the organic on the bottom now, aqueous on top. And you've got water molecules that are uh, becoming more strongly bonded as you go deeper down into there. But you've got these that are very weakly bonded, very, very weakly bonded. And this is, but what's most interesting about this is there's a frequency associated with this, OK? Now, when water bonds to other molecules, if it's just hanging out like this guy, just hanging out like this guy, if it's in air and it's not bonded to anybody, it has a frequency associated with it. If it grabs onto something else, like oil, that frequency will shift. If it then finds another water molecule up in the air and grabs onto it, that's even a stronger bond. It will shift even further. So the frequency of this peak right here tells us how much the uh, water likes something else. 
So da that's why there's so much intensity down here, because they really like each other. It shifts in that direction. OK. So, and then we know there's some bonding uh, to the aqueous phase. And then down in here, that's where you get about three or four angstroms down deep inside your water. That's where things start to bond with three or four other water molecules. Now, I should also say we won't see any signal at all if the water is randomly oriented. So if the surface, if there wasn't these, weren't these structured mo molecules there, we would never see them. Because of the optical process, they would cancel each other out. So at the surface, if you have half the water molecules like this and half the water molecules like this, we would never see them because the technique is only if you have something that looks different above than something that looks different below. So this tells us that, that that water interface is actually very structured as opposed to everybody kind of dancing around together. Okay. So I told you about that frequency that has a frequency that's associated with making that bond. And we were the first ones to be able to measure that. But then when we said, well, what happens if it grabs onto other things? Do you see that peak shift? And so this is just an example of what we found. Now, if you were at the vapor or the air-water interface, this is the frequency that you would see that's up here, frequency you'd see. But now let's start put some, putting some goop next to the water, some oil next to the water. If you put something that's more Teflon-like, a fluorocarbon, the water, the, there's a shift, see a lowering uh, the frequency. So it actually bonds a little bit to the fluorinated, to your Teflon pan, really weak, it's really weak. And then a little bit more when you get to hydrocarbons, so oils, and a little bit stronger when you get to carbon tet. And the reason that it's a little stronger with the carbon, well, these are sort of Van der Waals kind of interactions. This, this carbon tet is all kinds of electrons buzzing around and those, they polarize back and forth, it gives it some polarity. And then as you go a little further, you get a little more, more polar and eventually the interface dissolves in one another. Okay, until it gets a little bit more polar. So anyway, that, that peak has been very important to us because it gives us a measure of how much that water interacts with the oil. Now remember, I told you that there was a theory out there that said they don't touch. Well, blew that one away, didn't we? And then another one that said water won't have anything to do with oil, so it forms a clathrate. Blew that one away too, right? Now, is oil hydrophobic? Well, yeah, but not as hydrophobic as you might think in terms of it being to the extreme. Blew that one away too. Okay, so what we've learned then is there's weak hydrogen bonding in the middle, but oriented stronger and stronger as you go deeper. Now what this does is it sets up a junction where things are so, so set up that there's, we call a dipole there, that stuff can easily get there. So when we're trying to measure things going there, we know this interface actually facilitates it, and particularly, ions like salts. So this is important for biology because we always have, we always worry about ion transport getting across those junctions. Okay, so now that you've got a complete understanding of the oil water interface, I'm going to start throwing stuff in there. Start throwing stuff in there and see how it absorbs because again these are the first experiments that have ever been done that's been able to measure things like I'm going to tell you. So in this case what we're going to do is we're going to take some par charged polymers. We've done a bunch of just simple soaps. So your simple soaps, uh, let me just say a few words about your simple soaps. Your simple soaps, as you may know from introductory chemistry, is they tend to have a polar head group and a long oily tail. Does that make sense to any of you? Do you remember anything like that? They like to go to the interface because their head group goes into the water phase and their tail goes into the oil. They're very schizophrenic, but they're happy there, you know, because they kind of tug each way, okay? So the soaps that you have in your toothpaste or your shampoo or if you ever use either of those, um, they have a polar head group. A lot of times they're sulfate or sulfonate. So for example, your, I think it's your toothpaste that's sulfon uh, sulfonate with a long oily tail, but your soap is sulfate. So just one change in the oxygen and you could just be brushing your teeth with your soap or vice versa doing your laundry with your toothpaste. But the thing is, they behave very differently. That's why even with that one oxygen, they behave differently. And those are the kinds of things we study with the surfactants. How do, they, how do their head groups orient and so forth? OK, so now we're going to go more complicated, though. I'm jumping right in and let's talk about polymers, because polymers have a lot of important properties anyway. And so now, instead of those water bands, we're going to be looking at now uh, charged polymers that have a carboxylic acid on them. And so what we're going to look at is polymers that have 
uh, pKa, so they're going to have, be protonated or deprotonated somewhere around 5.5. And these are just the frequencies of the modes that we can pick up. This is just the frequencies of the modes that we can pick up. Okay, now, if you were to do a regular nice infrared spectroscopy, you'd put your sample in a nice little machine and you would scan thousand, several thousand wave numbers across, right? With the laser, you just get a few chunks and then you have to completely realign and then you do another few hundred nanometers and then you, so there's a, so that when you find something like this where you can measure a mode here and then mode to here and your laser works in both areas, you are very happy. Actually, my graduate students are very happy because it means a thesis. So, okay, so who cares about this? Well, this in particular, I'm going to tell you about polyacrylic acid, and that's an acid that has these carboxylic acids, and it's all over the place in our world. So it's, uh, it's coating on teeth so that they don't uh, break down from eating too much sugar. And then they're also on Band-Aids, right? And they're also in paint, polyacrylic, acrylic paints, polyacrylic acid. And then they're in diapers because for polyacrylic acid, it absorbs 200 times its weight in fluids. Doesn't that make sense? And so it really absorbs water very easily, but again, it's at some kind of a, a junction. So all polyacrylic acid is very common, but again, nobody, most of its uses, many of its uses are at something that would be a hydrophobic and an aqueous interface. Okay, so here's the deal. We wanted to know whether this polymer would lay down at the interface or whether it would just kind of go down like a ball. So what do we know about polyacrylic acid? Well, about these polyelectrolytes. Well, this one in particular is a weak polyelectrolyte, and that means that it, uh, let me go with the next one. My slide, whoop. Okay, so, and less is known about their behavior at the oil-water interface, but let's go back up to here. So. If it's uncharged, if it's uncharged, that polymer in solution, because it's water soluble, that polymer in solution likes to ball up. But when it gets charged, it strings out because there's repulsive interactions between the charges on the units on the chain. So we wanted to know if it goes to the interface, would it go up as a ball or would it lay down across that interface? So, this is just for those that know some spectroscopy. And so what we're doing then is we're looking, this is now the polymer, and at low pH, it's going to be protonated. Once you get past four and a half or five, it's going, at a high pH, it becomes deprotonated. So this is charged, this is uncharged. So in this case, it would be, in this case at the low pH, in the bulk solution, it would tend to ball up. However, once you get to it deprotonated, again, it strings out. But that's in the bulk. Nobody knew what would happen at the, at the surface. Okay. And so in this case, then, we're going to monitor the, the frequency, the spectrum at one set of frequencies and another. But we're also then, these are CH modes, so we can also go after these guys. Now, the only way we're going to see these show up in this spectrum is if, one, they're there, the polymer is there, but two, that they are aligned. They have a net orientation, like soldiers. Okay, they have to be aligned for us to see them. So the question is, are they gonna go there? And secondly, are they going to be aligned? Now, if they're gonna be a ball, they're not going to be aligned, right? All right, that was a hint. Okay, so now, so we're gonna pick up the CH modes also. Okay, so does it absorb? Okay, now, if it didn't absorb, I'd probably be the end of my talk, so that should give you a hint. Right, does it absorb? Okay, so now we're gonna do a vote. Now, really, I'm not gonna, you don't get tested on this, it's just, just to see how brave you are. How many people think it's gonna go to the interface, I already gave you that it goes there, when it's a ball, when it becomes protonated, and it's a ball, in bulk solution, or how many of you, okay, how many vote for that one? Nobody. Okay, how about when it's deprotonated and it becomes charged? Do you think then it'll go to the interface? Oh, I got one, two, maybe three, four. Oh, you're so brave. I see a few like this. Okay, so here we go. Unchar charged, so low pH. If it shows up there at low pH, that means it's uncharged, right? It's protonated. High pH, that's gonna mean it's charged. Here we go, there it is. Strong signal and only at low pH. So it only goes there only goes there when it actually is protonated. 
So it's balled up in solution, and we find out it goes to the interface, and it's got this wonkin' sharp peak. I mean, we don't see these sharp peaks unless everybody is standing up like a soldier. I mean, these are, this means that these carboxylic acids are like this, and they're protonated at the interface. And so, and, and this then is the CH modes, and that means that the backbone modes of the polymer are also highly oriented, highly structured, completely not at all what we would expect it to see. But really cool to be able to see this. So, what happens now if we change the pH? So now let's change the pH where now we pull the hydrogens off and it becomes charged. And what we find is that the pH 1.5 to 4, it's on. This is the carboxylic acid mode. And then you get to 4.5 to 10 and it goes off, it's gone or disordered. And then you go, and, but then you start looking at the, the charge uh, spectrum and it never shows up. So it only shows up when it's protonated. That's interesting. And so then we did the surface tension, that looked at, kind of plotted out this, and what you, this is like a titration curve. You know what a titration curve is, right? It usually goes like this, right? It usually goes like this. This is like woo, and then, so it's on and then it's off like that, which is very unusual. And I'll come back to this in a minute. But it just tells us what the polymer's doing there. Okay, we did the surface tension. Surface tension is high. When you're 4.5 to 10, that means there's nothing there. But now when something goes there, it lowers the surface tension like your soap does, and you see 1.5 to 4. But it's almost identical whether you're at 1.5 or to 4. It doesn't make any difference. So strong absorption in the acid form, but it doesn't look like that at the interface. It looks all strung out. And so then we, and so this is just simply the spectra uh, uh, corroborating what I just uh, told you about. This spectrum is actually the CH modes, and this is now what happens when stuff comes off. You've got the free, what we call the free OH, that sharp peak, and then that broad peak. Okay, so now, but let me just come back to this for a minute. So here's the deal. Normally when you think you're going to measure something and you're going to get a signal every time something goes there, okay? Normally you think as, as more and more stuff goes down that your signal gets stronger, okay? So the more stuff you go, so if I'm measuring how much stuff is there and my stuff is related to my signal, the more, you, the, more the polymer goes down there, the more I would get stronger and stronger signal. And so the surface tension measurement told us that that polymer over an hour, more and more and more of that polymer was going down. But the surface tension is not, isn't sensitive to orientation or how much, it's just how much stuff is there. However, the sum frequency, the vibrational signal, as stuff goes down, the first two minutes you get a signal. The next two minutes you get a signal this high. The next 20 minutes, you get a signal that's this high. The next hour, you get a signal that's this high. So the, the, what, the, what the signal, the, the vibrational signal is telling you is more stuff isn't going down. More ordered stuff isn't going down. And yet the, the, the surface tension says, you've got a lot of stuff going down there. And so the different, the, what the resolution of this uh, issue is that the following is actually going, down, going on, which again had never been seen before. The first layer goes down beautifully aligned with its carboxylic acid and its backbones aligned, and the next layers go down completely disordered. Okay, so they now go down as balls, but that first layer goes down beautifully. And why it goes down beautifully was because I told you that there's that field at the interface that helps align things. So again, very different than anyone would have expected. Now, for th now, the other interesting thing about this is so interfacial charge reduction, that's just the, the speech that we speak that we use, reduces the in interfacial orientation. So then how does the charge density, we play a lot about how charge density then affects things going down onto it. And so what we, th what we were thinking was, what was most concerning to us was that titration, kind of that titration curve where it was on and then it was off in such a, in within two, pH, two tenths of a pH unit. It's on and then it's off, okay? And so why would, because if it's a normal uh, something being deprotonated, it would be 
10% gets deprotonated, then 20%, and the pH changes like that. And so we did some experiments where we just took different chain lengths. And what we discovered was that what was going on to give that sharp rise was something that's very collective, a collective behavior. So for example, if, if, the, if somebody uh, next to you becomes deprotonated, you kind of go like this, and that causes them to be deprotonated. And so collectively, it's basically like a disease. <laughs> You know, when somebody gets infected, suddenly everybody gets infected, right? Or I oftentimes saying lining up for a movie. You know, nobody's in line and then two or three people show up and then everybody shows up. Well, it's this collective behavior that's causing this, pro pro this polymer to quickly come off when you change it by just a little bit. And we did different lengths change. So, what, and so this was just a picture of, of that kind of a, a data, but I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, and, nor this either. But the bottom line is what's happening with this particular polymer, this kind of influential rub and elbows, is that as you have chunks, in fact, the paper is called chunks of charge, and um, what happens is that as the, you have chunks of this polymer that become deprotonated, they are soluble in water. And so these are soluble and these are insoluble in water. And so what it does is it pulls the whole polymer off, even though chunks of the polymer are still staying protonated. So again, very interesting collective behavior that hadn't been seen before. And that's what that's talking about. And then just <coughs> building on this was to take peptoid sheets and look how they assemble at the interface too, doing the spectroscopy of, of the sheets. And so peptoids are an interesting possibility for drug delivery systems as well as other materials. And they have all these amine groups and then carboxylic acid groups. And the question was, well, why do you get these ordered uh, polymers, peptoids that form at an interface? And what we did was to actually show that these polymers lay down on each other because as the next layer goes down, its amines go here and its carboxylic acid go here, and then it alternates. And we were able to pick up the spectral signature that shows that the CH2 is bonded to the carboxylic acid. I'll skip through that too. And it's because you have these interactive uh, junctions between the amine and the carboxylate. Attractive interactions work, but when we did peptoids that just had repulsive interactions, you couldn't get the peptoid sheets to form. So the important part of these studies was to demonstrate this attractive interaction was important. And this is just some of the data, the spectra associated with that. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up by talking uh, now about, uh, spending a few minutes talking about now what happens when you, before what I've talked about so far, it's all about a planar interface. It's a planar interface, okay? But most of the usages of, of oil and water, as I mentioned, are when you form an emulsion. So take that oil and water, shake it up, it forms little tiny droplets of oil in your water, and then it might eventually separate. And so, that, and so that's what's in all these emulsive products, but now we wanted to be able to do the experiment where we are now looking at a nano, the surface of a nano droplet rather than the surface, the flat surface, okay? So these experiments were at least an order of magnitude, if not two order of magnitude, harder than the planar because you, you gotta get the signal off this little tiny nano droplet or lots of nano droplets. Okay, but it still is important because this is in, you know, these emulsions are in everything. And so, but it's also related to what I was mentioning before about the environment, okay, sidebar for the, for the um, environmental reason. So. I talked about an oil spill initially, right? We don't like oil spills. We don't do very good at cleaning them up either because we don't have good ways. One of the most common ways to clean up an oil spill is to take an airplane, fly over it, and spew out a bunch of chemicals on the oil layer. And those chemicals then, then make that layer of oil break up into little tiny droplets. It's the same kind of thing I was talking about before. It breaks the surface tension and you form these tiny droplets. Those chemicals then surround the droplet, make the droplet stable so it lasts a long time. And those droplets then can be washed off into the ocean and microbes eat them and live, uh, but also they can just be washed off into the ocean. Here's the problem. That's the most common way to, to take care of an oil spill. Here's the problem. Those chemicals are ex extraordinarily toxic. <laughs> so you add toxic to toxic. So, um, and it's not just one chemical, it's a mixture of chemicals and it's called Corexit. But it's the most commonly used dispersant to disperse the oil. 
So as so one of the things that we've been working on is to try to understand with our oil water studies, all of our oil water studies, what information we can give to help people create safer dispersants. Imagine a dispersant that's biodegradable, that can go onto the oil layer, break it up into tiny little droplets, and then with time just simply degrade. That is the holy grail of oil spill cleanup. That is the holy grail, but we aren't there yet. Most people just use Corexit because it's the easiest thing to do. But, you know, people get humans get sick when they're trying to clean up the birds and everything else. So coming up with it means that you need to back up and figure out the kind of information that we've discovered here. But also what happens when one of these, some kind of a dispersant or surfactant goes to a droplet interface? What's it look like on a molecular level? And that's what we've been working so hard to understand. But we've first got to get the experiment to work where you can look at a droplet rather than the straight surface. So I'm just going to give you an example of these initial experiments that we've done so you can see the kind of information that we get. We're not there yet, uh, but and we will not be necessarily, it's, we leave it to the organic chemists to build the new dispersants. What we want to do is give them what the properties are that are important for that oil water interface. And so in this case, uh, we're looking at now regular emulsions, which are oil droplets in water. But then there's also reverse emulsions, which are water droplets in oil. And now we're going to do the same kind of spectroscopy that I uh, talked to you about before to figure out what's going on right here at the surface, right here at the surface. So the laser beams come in and they scatter off. So it becomes like a scattering experiment rather than just a simple reflection. <coughs> okay, so what we did then was to take a molecule that's called AOT, and this, this molecule here is AOT <laughs> that's in there. And why did we choose AOT? AOT is one of the components of this Corexit mixture, okay? But AOT is in your ice cream. <laughs> AOT is safe. But it's when you add all the other chemicals to it that makes it uh, toxic but also makes it more effective as a dispersant. So we thought, why not start with the most act one of the most active components and understand how it behaves? And so what we've been doing then is to look at this droplet with these AOT molecules on there. And just like with the rules I told you before, if we're going to measure the spectrum of these molecules that are here, they have to be aligned at the interface, okay? And uh, after about two years worth of work, um, we actually were able to get a spectrum to show that AOT at an oil droplet interface aligns to the degree that we can see it and we can understand it. And so this is what AOT looks like if you were to just blow it up. Now the nice thing is it forms both regular, it stabilizes, I'm going to say stabilizes because it stabilizes that droplet, stabilizes at both the oil water uh, reverse and regular nanomotion. And we're looking at water surfactant interactions. And also what water does what water does with that surface. Again, to get the full picture of what the party looks like going on there. And then we again do, but we do the planar experiments and we also do the curved interfaces because we want to know if you've got something stabilizing those nanodroplets, then its behavior at the nanodroplet has to be different than the planar because at the planar it doesn't have to do that extra work to stabilize. So what we're looking at is what different properties there are at the droplet versus the planar. And so this is just, um, now I know that many of you may look and say this just looks like, a, you know, some spectral features or just looks like some lumps. I tell you, as a mother <laughs> and a research director, you're really proud of things like this when your students pull off something like this because it's so difficult. But what it does tell us that AO2 is AOT is aligned at the interface and that's why we get the CH modes, we pick up the CH modes at the planar interface and then also and the, the frequencies but then also this is the spectrum that we get at the nanomotion surface. And you see, you know, it looks a bit different, but, you know, to a spectroscopy eye, they're very similar. They're very, very similar. And again, the frequencies are also similar. So the bottom line is, and then we also did the reverse emulsions. This is just, these spectra look really awful because there's a lot of interference, but we understand it. What spectra like this are telling us is that the water here Water is strongly hydrogen bonded at the surface, and then there's a strong orientation going on here for the AOT molecules at both the planar and the emulsion interface. Oh, that was a good way to turn this. 
let's see, how do I get these back? There they go, okay. Or water is highly coordinated, a lot of going on there with the water parter. Okay, so that's the end of my story, because I see I'm pretty close to the end of my time. So to summarize, we've started a lot about the oil water interface, and I've hopefully shared with you, learned, got you to learn a little bit about soaps and surfactants, both at the neat interface as well as when we put polymers there, and then also that we see striking similarities between what's happening at the polar and the, and the droplet interface. And why this is so, to us, this is so important because we've done 20 years of work on the planar interface. This is the last two years of work. And we always justified that the planar interface, what's going on here, would be very similar to the emulsion interface. So we're so happy that the results turned out that way. Okay, so now, and this is the most important slide of all the slides that I've shown you because this is my research group back home. They should be in bed right now. Well, maybe not. Maybe they'll be working. Um, but they, what, I've, what I want to particularly point out here is Jen Hensel, who set up the scattering experiment initially that was so difficult to do, and Andrew Carpenter, who's taken it on and just done a remarkable job with it, um, and then others involved in this uh, experiment, the Drilling Oil and Water Studies, Regina, Brandon, and Bree, also um, theory, uh, Nick Valley, done a lot of our MD simulations. Fred Moore is a local faculty member that comes and visits us every summer. Uh, Clive has also done a lot of the oil water studies. And then these three students here, as also with Bree, are the ones that are doing a lot of our atmospheric studies where we're trying to understand issues of atmospheric pollution using similar techniques. So let me just finish by thank you all uh, for staying alert uh, during my talk and listening and uh, also uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, in the interest of time, we can have questions and discussions over the, um, over the snacks break. Uh, we would like to request our Dean, Professor uh, Bhagwat, to give a token of our appreciation on behalf of the Institute, uh, a bouquet, and a And a memento. Great. Great. Thank you. May I now request Professor Zoshi to introduce to us our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Colin Sucklings, who graduated from University of Liverpool and has spent most of the rest of his academic career in the University of Static Lead. His current research interests is on the focus of synthesis and properties of heterocyclic compounds designed as molecular probes for biological systems as drugs, principally for treating the infectious disease. He has many fascinating projects in pipeline for rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, and he has published about 250 papers and few books. He is fellow of Indian Society of Chemists and Biologists and fellow of many learned societies across the globe. And today he is going to talk to us on strathic lead minor groove binders, pluripotent anti-infective compounds to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much. Professor Sakling. Another one. Transmitter, man, badge, badge,
So that's that's forward and back on this. Thank you for waiting for those few moments whilst I found the necessary files. The first thing I want to say is what a great honour I feel it to be to be invited to present to you today in the VDT uh, Fellowship series of, of lectures. It was totally unexpected, but uh, an enormous delight to be offered this opportunity. What I want to try to do for you is to describe the Strathclyde Minor Groove Binders project, almost from the beginning to where we are today, and to show you the wide range of different scientific components that we've had to bring in to get to the, to, to the, the clinical position that we have with respect to one compound and the scientific position that we have with respect to others. And this will involve looking not only at medicinal chemistry, it will involve looking at some physical chemistry and some biology also. So I come to you from the University of Strathclyde, which is in the city of Glasgow. You can see the location pointed out on that map of the UK. The building on the right-hand side is where my team works, and on the left-hand side is the, the site of a lot of our biological testing in our biology department. First thing I want to do is to give you the context, because all of this has the context of antimicrobial resistance. This is why we are doing the research. Roger Way, a, a retired colleague of mine, about 15 years ago, and I discussed how we might make use of one particular group of compounds that had been introduced to us by an industrial company that didn't have sufficient chemistry to carry out its objectives. And at that time, there weren't statements such as those that you can see on the screen behind me here. Statements about drugs that are, have been used for treatment of infectious disease being no longer able to cope. For example, in South Africa, the paper saying they're back to Victorian times. And take it right next to my home, taking to Scottish hospitals where 10 years ago there was a serious outbreak of Clostridium difficile infections partly due to poor uh, hospital and antibiotic management, but also because of the difficulty then of treating the infection once it was established. And you can find a huge number of examples that show the problems that have arisen in the world, and more importantly, will arise in the world if we are not able to deal in some way with antimicrobial resistance. Now, these are two pages taken from a review by Jim O'Neill, who is a member of the House of Lords in the UK. Usually, as we are all too aware in Western countries now, government does not listen to scientists. Um, and Jim O'Neill's not a scientist, he's an economist. So what they rather craftily did was they said, don't tell us about how, how this is going to be a real problem, a people problem. Get it calibrated in cash terms. And of course it is, it's a desperate people problem, particularly if you're one of the people who cannot be treated or you're, you're one of their family. But the whole effort of this report put into the context of what it means to the world economy if we find ourselves unable to treat infectious disease. And what we can see over here on the right is an estimate of numbers of disease, disease cases and deaths therefrom, if we go into the body of the paper, you'll see that translated into cash terms. And I don't need to do that to make my point that this is a critical situation 
and you see the title is Health and Wealth of Nations. So a lot has been done. And what I want to do now is to show you the basic ideas that we had when we started our project in terms of using compounds that are known as minor groove binders. Now, as I'll show you, minor groove binders bind to the minor groove DNA, of course, and by designing the particular structures, we could control how they bind and where they bind to a quite a large extent. And so I would like to try and go through these four points tell you something about the origin and evolution of our compounds, give you a survey of what we've been able to achieve in anti-infective activity, say something about our current lead compound, which just this month has gone into a phase two clinical trial for that very infection, Clostridium difficile, that I mentioned a moment ago, and then to round up by talking about African animal trypanosomiasis. So we're not just interested in people, we're, we're interested in treatments for um, livestock as well. Now, the bottom note is important because my lab is concerned with design and synthesis interpretation of data, but without a very large number of very, very valued biological collaborators, we would not have been able to get where we have. So we had in mind these points. One of the standard things in the pharmaceutical industry is that a drug is devised to target a particular protein or, or other macromolecule in the biological system. So they have a single molecule, which is the drug, targeting a single biological polymer, giving a single effect. The big worry about that in the anti-infective area is that the infectious organisms are capable of devising ways, to use an anthropomorphic term, that allow them to remove the activity, perhaps by exporting it, perhaps by chemically modifying it through their enzymes, perhaps by changing some intracellular substructure. So if you want to have something that is going to be resilient to the formation of resistance, then you would say we need to target many different sites. And one of the reasons why DNA is a useful target to, continue, to consider is that over the large DNA molecules, we have a number of independent sites or quasi-independent sites to which our drug ligands can bind and exert their effect. So if we do that, would we find that the multiple targeting there would lead to more resilient compounds and a reduction of the risk in generating resistance? If we do it, can we find compounds that are sufficiently selective between the host for the pathogen, which could be our cells, which could be an animal, or, and the, the pathogen? And that's critical because if you don't have selectivity, you don't have a useful drug. Well, the basis for our project, like many other drug discovery projects, is in natural products. And in particular, these two streptococcal natural products known as distamycin and natropsin. And you see that the basic core part of these molecules, the body of these molecules, if you like, is made up of N-methylpyrrole amides. On the right-hand side, and I've colored this in blue throughout the talk, we have a flexible component which is known as the tail because it can wag. And then at the other end, we have a rigid component, which is in red, which is known as the head. These molecules have a curvature that reasonably well matches the curvature of the DNA double helix, and they will bind comfortably in the minor groove of DNA, and I'll show you more examples of that shortly. So what we've done as medicinal chemists is we've changed the head groups and changed the tail groups principally. We have made some modifications to the, the body, and there's one down here, but by making these various changes, we can target different organisms and different diseases. So here's an indication of what our initial hypothesis was. Here we have the two strands of DNA. Here we have the minor groove. And here we have two molecules of a minor groove binder. The two molecules are there because if you have compounds that have single charge, they tend to bind two to one in the minor groove of DNA, and I've got some evidence about that shortly. 
But most of the interactions that people had considered, quite naturally enough, were positive charges with phosphates of DNA and, of course, hydrogen bonding from the, the pyrrolamides with the polar components at the bottom of the DNA, which include um, projecting functional groups, particularly from the, the G bases of the DNA sequence. However, there are also some hydrophobic patches associated with the carbon-hydrogen bonds of the ribose, which had not been looked at at that time as significant with respect to the binding of ligands. And we said to ourselves, that's Roger Way and, uh, and I, if we can increase the interactions there, maybe we can get some more potent compounds that would have some therapeutic utility. So here are some common structural features of our compounds. We have head groups that are linked by amidines, by amides, the amides such as in distamycin and atropsin, and also, as I'll point out more strongly in a moment, by an alkene. We have the heads, we have, sorry, we have the heads, and we have the tails, and the tails are principally identified by having a low PK1, which is the morpholine, a reasonably high PK1, the dimethylamino, and an amidine, which is uh, the high PK tail group. Now, this comes from our first substantial paper in the field and shows the range of different structures that we looked at. This is a collection of head groups. Here we have a collection of the tail groups. And here we have some variations within the body structure. The ARAR ring, we, the phenar ring, we have in some important compounds. The pyridine ring we have also. The quinoline, the three substituted quinoline, is an important component, as indeed are the morpholine and the amidine. Now, these molecules are put together really fairly straightforwardly by appropriate couplings. This is a synopsis of the coupling methods for our, um, <coughs> for our very first work. In that first work, we had pyrrole trimers, and we acylated them with appropriate aromatic carboxylic acids. Um, in the amide case, in the amidine cases, we used fairly standard procedures using um, S-methyl ureas. And the most interesting one, the most important one, turned out to be the synthesis of the alkene-containing compounds. And this we did starting with a Wittig horn, mod uh, horn modification of the Wittig reaction to make the alkene component with one pyrrole or with one ARAR group attached there, and then stringing that together with a dimer um, that had already been prepared. So essentially, it was a 2 plus 2 coupling reaction. And the important thing about that is it is scalable. It's been scaled up by the Almac company in Northern Ireland uh, sufficiently to allow the production of kilo batches that have been used for clinical trials. And the scale-up followed about 90% exactly what the laboratory synthesis route had been. That's quite unusual. The step at which the biggest problem occurred was in the very final step. And here is that expressed in, in a little bit more, more detail that shows the way we are doing things with the more difficult compounds that we're trying to make now. We make our head group. We put one pyrrole on that has a T-butyl ester, coupled to give a trimer. We make the a monomer with the various tail groups that we want, including substituted amidines, carry out the couplings, and they produce the current generation of new compounds that we're investigating. Now, all of that is standard chemistry. The trouble really is that when you change, you don't know what the physical chemical properties are likely to be for each compound. So you find that you have to do a deal of experimental work in order to reach each of the target compounds. Now, let's talk a little bit about the DNA selectivity and targeting DNA. And I'm going back to some quite early studies that we did. And these were done with the help of Keith Fox at the University of Southampton who has a range of oligonucleotides with well-known sequences that allow you to identify what particular um, sites your molecules are binding at. This particular one started with tetramers, and we looked at um, a standard compound without a big head group containing different alkyl groups, and we also looked at this synthetic compound. 
Now, this one we call thiazotropsin because it's got the thiazole in it. And this was a, an excellent compound from which we could learn how our compounds behave. The outcome of this study was that the N-alkyl pyrroles tend to read very prominently AT-rich rich sequences, although there are Gs in. But the most important result was probably this here, in which our thiazotropsin was really quite selective for the sequence ACTAGT. In particular, um, the, uh, the G and the T are significant. So this was studied in more detail using spectroscopic methods. And I've just picked out a few of the, the slides that show those data. Here we see our target there that we had identified, wrapped up in a, a, a decamer. And if you look at the chemical shift differences when you compare free DNA with unbound DNA, you can see a very, very strong shift associated with the G which is where the thiazole binds. And then um, John Parkinson, our NMR spectroscopist, went on to do a full study looking at nuclear overhauser effects. And he showed that this is how our thiazotropsin molecule binds to this particular sequence of DNA. Now, there are a number of important little things here. This is the canonical DNA structure from the database, decorated to show the potentials, of course. And you can see there that the minor groove is actually quite narrow. When these molecules go in side by side, it gets much broader. And that broadening, of course, forces conformational changes elsewhere in the molecule. And that means that not just the binding site is influenced, but neighboring sites are also influenced, which will have an effect on the ability of that DNA sequence to bind promoters, transcription factors, and the like. When all of the biophysical measurements that we took were brought together, we came up with the following summary, and this was published about 10 years ago now. I've just mentioned the conformational changes, and that costs, but the energy comes from very strong binding energy, particularly associated with the hydrophobic interactions. If you quantify the differences, the preferential factor for thiazotropsin A binding to that hex in the sequence is about a hundredfold. So it's significant, it's a preference, it's not an absolute selectivity. Well, let's move from there now to active therapeutic compounds. Thiazotropsin A is active, but it's active against a wide number of, of organisms and it's also quite a toxic compound. The key thing that got us to the range of compounds that had sufficiently interesting activity to look towards development of a pharmaceutical was the substitution of an amide by an alkene, an isosteric substitution, as a medicinal chemist would say. And when we did that, the comparative activity of these two compounds was about 100-fold better compared with the original. Now, you might say, well, you're throwing away important hydrogen bonding interactions there, and of course we are. But when we looked at the TM measurements, the melting temperature measurements of these compounds binding to DNA, we found that the, we had a very superior head group in this 3 quinolar substituted compound compared with any of the others that we had. And another feature of this that we were aware of when we designed these molecules was that by having the conjugated rings, we would have fluorescent compounds. And that then allows us to have the opportunity to look and see where our compounds go in the biological um, target cells. So here are five examples of studies that we have carried out. The first, at the top left here, is with our partner company, MGB Biopharma, and this molecule, known as BP3, has gone into a phase two clinical trial just this month. Here we have a, relative, a, a related compound, but different both at the head and the tail group. 
And this compound has been selected as one that is active in a screen against uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, working in partnership with the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Up here, yet another compound with a different head group, but the same tail group as BP3, we have a molecule that is active against resistant chloroquine resistant strains of, of plasmodia. On the right here, we have a highly fluorescent compound with a good donor acceptor uh, component within it that is active against fungi, and in particular active against an emerging threat in the fun fungal area, Candida auris, and that's being investigated in partnership with the University of Manchester. And lastly, at the bottom, we have the um, studies that we're carrying out, particularly with the University of Glasgow, where we're looking at our compounds targeting at animal African trypanosomiasis. And in that case, we've been able to show that we have compounds that are um, active in vivo models of that particular disease. So, one of the things that is necessary if our compounds are to be taken forward is that they should be um, active against resistant strains to current drugs. And if we pick out the, a couple of lines from the, the data that our partner company, MGB Biopharma, has produced, we can compare a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus with a methicillin-susceptible one. And if you look at these figures, up and down, up and down, you'll see that they are essentially the same. So our compound is able to deal with the resistant strain as well as the susceptible strain, and a lot further studies have demonstrated that it is indeed a significantly active compound against a wide variety of molecule, a wide variety of bacteria. The next thing that we could look at to understand what is happening is how this molecule actually binds to, to DNA. And this again was done for us with footprinting by Keith Fox. One of the striking features about compound 4's behavior is that if you look at where we see the footprints, and they're on, on these various lanes with different um, probe nucleotides, we see that they go through to very, very low concentrations indeed. This is a very potent DNA binder. Compound 5 is a, a relative that was also considered for clinical development, but is active, but not quite as potent. And all of these sites are predominantly AT base rich. So here we have the translation of that into the actual sequences labeled up. So you, you can see where these things bind. And I put a couple of boxes in, which I will come back to later. The next thing that's important to understand is whether we have any selectivity between the different types of cells. Can we treat a bacterium without targeting a human cell? Well, what we have here is we have the experiment carried out with a mammalian cell, increasing the concentration of this molecule BP, BP2 in this case, that's compound 5 down there, and we see that it more or less flat lines. When we go into staph, we see that as the concentration increases, we get a catastrophic death. And that catastrophic death obviously has to be understandable in some way. So we have binding to DNA, we have selectivity, and we have to try to understand a little bit more about the nature of that selectivity. By taking advantage of fluorescence, we can look to see where the molecules go. And in these experiments carried out by uh, Chris Carter in our, in our biological laboratories, we looked at staph cells um, with BP3 in bright field and without BP3. It's the without at the top, it's the with with the bottom. And you can see that the cells light up. And we also looked <coughs> at a number of mammalian cells this one is a mouse melanoma cell line, and there is no lighting up whatsoever. So one of the important things, whatever else might be going on, is the access to cells in creating that selective toxicity. Well, it's not always a simp not all as simple as that, because getting a medicine requires that you can get it properly formulated and then delivered to the patient. And it turned out 
that this class of molecule, like BP3, has um, some challenging physical chemical properties, to put it politely. If you make up solutions in certain buffers and then allow them to stand, it forms gels. Um, and here we've got bond of BP3. Here we've got a sample that was made a couple of hours earlier. Turn it upside down, it's just stopped flowing. And the gels mean that when the development is done, our partner, MGB Biopharma, had to do quite a lot of work in order to find an acceptable formulation. And it did. It obtained some tablets, uh, some capsules, in which there was what they called a gastric formulation prepared that allowed us to have some, um, uh, some experiments to see whether the, the compound would work in an in vivo model of the C. diff infections. And that was done in, in hamsters. What you see in these two panels is the output from those experiments in comparison head-to-head -head with the standard drug vancomycin. Here we see in the colored bars the quantity of bacterium essentially after treatment in various parts of the um, digestive system. And you can see that our compound here, BP3, in its gastric formulation is substantially better than vancomycin. It's also substantially better than the free base, which is the gelling thing that I showed you a short time ago. And then when you take that to see whether it's capable of controlling the infection in, 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 in a function of time, we can see that the, um, the animals unfortunately die if they're not treated. If they're treated with the free base, they survive for some time, but then that becomes ineffective. And with both vancomycin and our formulated BP3, there is a long um, retention of active and effective life in this particular group of animals. So, what about the properties that are relevant to formulation of these compounds of ours? We know that they aggregate. We can see from light scattering experiments that there are actual particles there. We can see clear solutions, colloidal phases, and gel phases. They've all been observed. Exactly what you see depends upon pH, concentration, temperature, all of these things. Now, you remember I showed you the side-by-side -side, uh, orientation of the binding at the beginning of this talk. So one of the questions that would then come to mind is, how actually do our molecules organize themselves in solution? Do they go in into the DNA? from solution one by one, or do they go in as a, as a dimer? There are all sorts of questions like this that can be asked. So we did some NMR experiments. BP3 itself is a little complex to do, although it is now being done. And this related compound with the simpler head group was studied in NMR. And you'll notice here that this was at 80 degrees in water um, and deuterated water. And what you can see is you can see NOEs between 9 and 14 and 3 and 16 in particular. And 9 goes with 14, but that's too far. So this is an intra, I beg your pardon, an intermolecular effect. And 8 and 16 are additional intermolecular effects. And when that is taken into account, this is the sort of arrangement that we see. It suggests that in solution, we have the anti-parallel orientation and that the molecules are, are stacking. Now, if our little expedition into um, ah, here we have. What sort of sense does this make? So we did molecular dynamics calculations. And here we have two molecules of um, the, the compound that I showed you just a moment ago with the BP3 simplified hair group in a box of water, jiggling around, getting to know each other, snuggling up, and coming planar face to, well, so side by side, really very close side by side. And then when you reach the energy minimum, which is about to happen, there we are. We have them side by side, head to head, 
exactly the way that the NMR suggests that they should be and the way in which our previous structures indicated that they would be in binding to the, um, the DNA sequence. That's more entertainment than science, but it does help us realize just how significant the self-association of these molecules is. So let's now move into further uh, biological reactions and look at some of the um, effects that we have when we try to tackle more challenging bacteria than gram-positive bacteria. Our compounds are not very active against gram-negatives. And in general, that seems to be because they don't penetrate the outer cell wall. And that can be demonstrated, again taking advantage of the fluorescence, by comparing what happens with one of our compounds using E. coli, oh dear, beg your pardon, I'll come back to that. Yeah, using E. coli intact cells and using cells in which the outer surface has been taken off <coughs> using lysozyme. We can see very clearly that the fluorescence is taken up by the spheroplast without the cell wall, but not by the intact cells. So access to cells is very important. However, some of our more recent compounds, such as 428, do seem to be able to penetrate sufficiently to give um, an um, a, a bacteriostatic effect, even though they don't kill the cells within the time span. So that's encouraging that we might be able to deal with gram-negative bacteria. Also encouraging is that if we take a combination of our drug, BP3, with keftazidim, a, a commonly used beta-lactam, then we can find a range of concentrations in which where the, the two molecules are used together that do indeed lead to a killing of the bacterium, in this case, a Klebsiella, which was of particular interest because it came from one of our local hospitals. So this isn't just a laboratory strain, it's something that was really hitting a patient, and that patient, she could not be cured by existing drugs. Now that's an encouragement, and the work was done by my former PhD student, Fraser Scott, from the University of Huddersfield. In terms of mycobacteria, which also have cell wall <coughs> problems for drugs getting through, two compounds in particular, 362 and 364, have shown up to have significant activity against, t against mycobacterium tuberculosis in the laboratories of, of Rito Gula at the University of Cape Town. These are some of his data showing the um, untreated cells and the treated cells showing very, very little activity indeed. And um, this has been taken forward, not with 362, but with 364, to show that intracellular activity is important, but there's very limited toxicity to macrophages in which those experiments were carried out. And most particularly, very recently I've learned, but I don't have the data that I can share with you yet, that this compound is actually active in an in vivo model of tuberculosis. Now, one of the things that you have picked up from those previous few slides is that there's quite a wide range of head group that we have been using, and also that the amidine has come much more into focus. And we do find, in general, that the amidines are good news, and a lot of, sp of, of species variation can be obtained by using different head groups. What about BP3 and its mechanism of action? What can we say? about that. Does the multiple target design have any support? What effects does it have? Are these effects consistent with a reasonable understanding of that, that kill curve? Is there a development, is there um, evidence to say that we have a resilient drug? And of course, the same questions would apply to other applications. And this work's been done by Ian Hunter, Nick Tucker, Lena Neiman, and Akimon Lemonidis in our biology department primarily with the technique of RNA-seq. And what they did was they investigated the effects on the transcriptome of BP3. Control samples in a principal component analysis showed up here. This is where the treated samples were. This, this simply shows that there is a significant difference between the, those two. 
a lot of transcripts identified, and when they dug in to the bioinformatics, it turned out that L uh, enzymes associated with glycolysis were enhanced, flux through the TCA cycle seemed to be significantly reduced, and a number of consistent results that were consistent with energy depletion, together with uh, a reduction in the biosynthesis of certain nucleotides and amino acids. Now that work um, was taken further and validated by using PCR to conf confirm the reduction of particular uh, enzymes, of the, of the genes associated with the particular enzymes. And many of these turned out to be essential in the Staphylococcus aureus genome. This is the data that I showed you earlier from Keith Fox in the bottom part, and this is compared with the binding sites that were deduced from the, uh, the, the RNA-seq experiments. And you can see a lot of comparisons where there are matches, and some of them I've put in, in, in the yellow boxes and highlighted one with a star. The red regions are the promoter sequences. So these, comp these sites where the promoter sequences are um, have a substantial uh, AT co content in several of them, and it sort of lends some co co credence to the idea that the DNA binding of our compounds is significantly modifying the way in which these compounds, the way in which the cells are able to respond. Doesn't mean there aren't other things going on. And one of the things that it might mean, and although this is not done in staph, this was done with an E. coli. It shows that BP3 is able to inhibit the relaxation of supercoiled DNA by topoisomerase 1. So this is the, um, the relaxed form, and here we get to a concentration in which the supercoiled form remains um, absolutely clearly there. And CPT is countothesin as the, the positive control. So it is entirely possible that simple binding to DNA is not the only mechanism of action of these compounds. What about resilience? Well, the experiment done by our biologists was simply to take a large number of passages of BP3 using Staph aureus as our workhorse organism and comparing what happens with rivampicin. Now here you can see that the rivampicin comes back into life and you can see the, the clusters that are growing in the plates there. In all of the BP3 areas, there was no such growth. And it's not proved possible by simple passaging to obtain a resistant strain of Staph aureus yet to our BP3 compound. And that's also the case with respect to trypanosomes in some of the studies that I'll mention in a, bo in a moment. Briefly, what about antifungal applications? Now, antifungals are particularly interesting because of the wide variety of outer cell uh, content that they present. And it's very interesting to find that one of our compounds that does not contain an alkene now, it contains an amidine link, and also contains a different body group, a thiazole, is actually significantly active against Cryptococcus neoformans. But is inactive against Candida albicans. Now we rationalize that without any direct experimental evidence because, is because of the difference in the outer, uh, outer phase, phases of the cell walls of the two different organisms, one of which contains a phosphodiester and the other of which does not. So C. albicans contains a negatively charged diester and it may be that our compound with these positive charges, just sits there in the cell membrane, never gets in to see the target inside the cell. On the other hand, in a particularly encouraging set of results, Mike Bromley and his colleague Kan Xiao uh, at the University of Manchester have looked at this very fluorescent compound, um, <coughs> which is MGB363, and particularly pointed out, firstly, the very high activity uh, uh, against Candida vibrata, and also the fact that there is significant activity against Candida aureus, which is not something that is very common. They've done some further studies and are investigating mechanism of action using Aspergillus fumigatus, 
And because that molecule is nice and fluorescent, they've been able to do some time-lapse studies. And what we have here is, well, we have some aspergillus cells down at the bottom. Um, and they're, of course, under bright field. And they are modified with histone H1 green fluorescent protein. So you can see the cells over a period of time there. What we see in the middle with the red filter is the uptake of our compounds, primarily at the growing tips of these cells. But then you can see how clearly they, they localize from these yellows into the nucleus. Important that they get to the nucleus, but also clear implications that what's happening as they're taken up into the cells can also be significant. Now, my last example concerns animal African trypanosomiasis, which is very, very serious in sub-Saharan Africa. Here we can see a diseased cow in, in a village. The animals are a, a very critical part of the economic uh, system that works for these farmers in that part of the world. And the currently available drugs like dimidazine, isometodinium, and so on, are no longer sufficiently effective to provide cures and to provide prophylactic treatment. So we've reviewed a large number of our compounds in partnership with the University of Glasgow and the Swiss Tropical Health Institution in Basel. And the overall summary of the structure activity data refers to a constant region here, pretty well standard n methylpyrroles although we have some compounds with modifications here. An aromatic head group preferably with some sort of electron withdrawing substituents, and an amidine, much better than a tertiary amine or than a morpholine. And here's a panel of compounds that have been most extensively studied. You can see the structures that match what I've just told you. And you can see here the data for the various species. L6-tox is a mammalian cell. It's a, a, a rat cell that is a, a good measure of whether the compounds are likely to be sufficiently selective in their applications to treat this particular infection. All of these compounds, but these two, all of the compounds I'm going to show you after this, let me say, are amidines, and we have two tertiary amines. With respect to the amidines, 234 is reasonably potent and has quite a good selectivity index. The two species, Trypanosoma congolense and Trypanosoma vivax, are the two most important species with respect to the African disease. So these are sufficiently interesting to say to us we must look at these compounds further. If we want to probe, we do have an active compound in terms of 246, but the selectivity is too poor for that to be developed in terms of um, uh, an, an active medicine. 235 is similar, and 248 is also a possibility, although it's somewhat more toxic. So those were the highlight compounds that came uh, from the whole set that you can see shown on these two slides, where we've got comparative activities against Trypanosoma congolense and Trypanosoma vivax. Not surprisingly, it's a sort of a straight line. They, one, if one's good on one, it's good on another, but that's not always the case. The most active compounds are down here, so we want to get as far into this yellow region as we can with our compounds. 234, 235, 248 are in this region, so they are active, and the bigger the bubble that's been put on the third dimension of this plot, the, least, the less toxic the molecule is. So we do have more active compounds, but with the small dots, we can see that they are too toxic for further investigation. One of the first things we have to demonstrate is that these compounds are not cross-resistant with respect to existing drugs like dimidazine. Now, dimidazine here is shown with respect to the wild type, where it is very active, and two uh, strains of Trypanosoma congolensi that are resistant to different strains, and here we can see the values associated with those, a ratio of about 12. For many of our compounds, and in particular for 234, we find that the value of the ratio is close to one, which implies that we're not got, we, ha we don't have a cross-resistant problem, and therefore they are 
possible for further progression and investigation. And this work has been done largely by Federica Giordani in Michael Barrett's laboratory at the University of Glasgow. Well, what do they do? The evidence that Federica has come up with suggests that the pathology after the compounds have been taken on concerns the transformation between the normal cell type, which is one kinetoplast, a DNA-containing organelle, and one nucleus, into compounds that have, into cells that have multiple kinetoplasts and multiple nuclei. And you can see those plotted out as a time course there, and I've indicated the same places with the arrows. And you can see the data from which, the images from which these data were produced. Some of them are down here. Here's the 72R point where you can see cells with two nuclei and a number of, of kinetoplasts present. Now, this distinguishes these compounds from existing minor group binders whose mechanism of action involves migration to the kinetoplast and then destruction of that cell organelle. Now, we don't know more about the underlying biology that leads to that, that result, but by forming these uh, multiple kinetoplast, multiple nuclei uh, structures, the cells are unable properly to divide and to propagate. There have been some experiments done to look at the metabolomics associated with the effect of SMGBs on um, trypanosomes. What we can see here is a collection of compounds whose distribution concentrations have changed more than a factor of two. And you can see what they are labeled down here, mostly associated with um, nucleotide metabolism. And um, this sort of information is the first thing that we have that's allowing us to see what might be going on within the cells. Very early days, but it's a, a good start. Very recently, Federica produced some information for some of our um, newest compounds, in particular a compound that's number 402. And when this was looked at with respect to TB brucei and also Congolensi, what was interesting at a first glance was how steep these kill curves were, just like the antibacterial ones. Not quite so steep here, but still it's very, very steep. Bringing together those two series of studies and comparing with the effect of these molecules, here we have in the various purples, the 402 studies against the um, HEK402 cell line. So we've got the selectivity built in there. And the profiles of these compounds move to being really uh, very impressive. I'll move directly to 402 and compare that with 360. 402 is now sub-nanomolar in many of the assays that we've done. It's a little bit too toxic in this test, but the selectivity index is very, very high, particularly the work that was done at the Swiss Tropical Research Institute. 360 is a little bit behind, but it's actually a little bit ahead in terms of our development studies because we've been able to show that 360 is curative in mouse models of the diseases caused by both Congolensi and Vivax. Also, we have information from a collaborator in South America that 402 is effective in an intracellular assay against the uh, trypanosome cruzi, which is the parasite that's effective cattle and people in South America. Now that's of interest not just for itself, but because taxonomically that takes us very close to another kinetoplastid, namely Leishmania. And for that reason, we are just beginning a collaboration with CSIR and NCL in Pune, where they are going to look for us at the effectiveness of our compounds against Leishmania strains that are of importance in India. And in many parts of India, this is a really serious problem, although not, I think, in Mumbai itself. How did we do in getting into that region of, of yellow space? Here's the chart that I showed you before. Here are those four compounds on the preceding slide, and here they are here. 392, which I didn't comment on, it's very active, but it's also far too toxic. 
but 360 is clearly an improvement, and 402 is also a substantial improvement. Whether it's sufficiently selective um, to, to be further developed, I don't know, but certainly seeing those amidine structures that belong to the compounds here, together with the respective head groups, and I know I haven't been able to show you the exact structure of that yet, um, this is definitely pointing us in the right direction. Now, I've mentioned a number of different laboratories in this survey, and these dots show you where our compounds have been evaluated around the world. Um, it's something that I'm really quite pleased about. We're not interested in, in introspective activities, despite what some of our Western politicians might suggest. We're here in science for the whole world, and we want to work with the world to solve problems that matter to people. Antimicrobial resistance is one. It shows itself in different forms and in different places. So have our compounds stood up to the tests of their potential and their activity? Well, we have shown significant levels of activity against gram-positive bacteria, mycobacteria, parasites, and fungi. Maybe we can get gram-negatives. We'll find out. Different compounds are active against different infectious organisms. Very serious thera the um, therapeutic challenges, such as TB and new fungal infections, can in principle be met by our compounds. The original idea that we might have biological effects on several pathways is supported by the emerging data from both staff and TRIPS studies. And when resistance has been sought, it's not yet been found. I think it will come. I, I, I can't believe that biology isn't capable of finding resistance to our compounds, but it's going to be a lot tougher job to find than um, with a conventional single target drug. And probably from the last study, the only current series of compounds anywhere in the world that can tackle Congolensi, Vivax, and Cruzi is based upon our compounds. So we have to optimize each, each of, these, um, of these candidates to reach a development level stage, at which point, having shown proof of concept and identified development candidates, the academic work more or less stops. Mechanism of action studies can continue, but the discovery process stops, and we depend crucially then upon getting good industrial partners. Well, you don't need just to believe me. Um, there are reports all over the place about uh, activity, about activity and research in, in the AMR area. This is one that came out at the beginning of last year, and it listed four criteria, ignore that bullet point, four criteria um, for a candidate molecule to, ca to count as a new drug, and that's new chemical class, new target, new mode of action, absence of cross-resistance. And they identified only five, of which MGB Biopharma and our compound BP3 was the uh, included and happens to be top of that list. So I think people are beginning to see that we have something in our collection that can be converted into real value for patients and for animals in the world. And finally, I would just like to acknowledge some of our funders from the, the UK's research councils and from the Scottish office funds. And also, once again, although I already have, acknowledged the absolutely essential importance of our biological and other chemical collaborators in getting the project to where it is just now. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Truly fascinating lecture in the era of heterocyclic chemistry. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Yadav to come on dais and to felicitate Dr. Suckling by offering a flower, floral bouquet and the momentum. Oh, I don't have it. I'll let you take that first.
Thank you very much. That's very nice. Take off the, the microphones. Yeah. All are requested to join for high tea at every quadrangle. So please assemble there.